The skincare industry goes through a different hype cycle every few years, and the latest trend taking the world by storm is Korean beauty. Whether it's their snail mutant moisturizers, their bee venom serums, or even their 10-step skincare routines, it seems like every skincare influencer in the world is obsessed with K-beauty. But is all of this praise and enthusiasm justified, or is this just the latest hype cycle that will fizzle away in a few years' time? In this video, I'm gonna talk about what Korean skincare is, then focus on their unique ingredients and philosophies. This is some of the dumbest shit I've heard in my life. Discuss whether I think they have better evidence than Western skincare brands, and then talk about what I think the real reason is that K-Beauty is so popular. And spoiler alert, it's because of Squid Games. I mean, who wouldn't want to look like Gumbo over here? My name is Osama and I'm a board certified dermatologist living and working in New York. I refuse to take any skincare related sponsorships on this channel and therefore you know all of my videos and reviews are completely honest. If you like that kind of factual, no nonsense skincare content, make sure you're subscribed. So without further ado, Shija Gaja. That feels like it may have been problematic, but uh, I don't know, let's see. So what is Korean skincare? Well, apart from the obvious, which is skincare popular in the country of South Korea, because disclaimer, I don't really know what they do in North Korea. What ingredients, philosophies, and approaches define Korean skincare? Now, obviously there's a lot that goes into a whole country's skincare practices, and I can't summarize it in 10 minutes, but I think I've done a pretty good job of crystallizing the key themes right here. And those are the following. Number one, an emphasis on natural ingredients. And in particular, those I'm showing on screen right now, including green tea, ginseng, snail mucin, and bee venom. Number two, double cleansing, which is something I'll explain later. I don't know how many of you can hear my baby son in the background, but that's the reason I haven't filmed videos for the last few months. I am a new dad. He is four months old and he is extremely loud. Okay, where was I? Number three, layering, and that is the infamous Korean 10 step skincare routine. Number four, obsessive sun protection. Now we all know sun protection is important, but in K-beauty that is taken to a whole new level. And number five, innovation. They produce innovative new skincare products at a much faster rate than Western companies. So let's explore each of these in turn and figure out whether K-Beauty really has the upper hand. So everybody loves natural ingredients. And as you can tell, based on my tone of delivery, I hate this obsession. As I've said many times on my channel, natural means absolutely nothing. It's become a complete marketing term, and that's because if you're motivated enough, you can label any ingredient as natural, such as Botox, because it comes from a bacteria. Look how beautiful nature is. But enough of me being grumpy, let's focus on the K-beauty natural ingredients that have made them so popular, starting with green tea. This is often praised because it minimizes UV damage, is antioxidant, and is also pro-collagen in theory. Most of the benefits of green tea are attributed to polyphenols and catechin. But I'm gonna level with you. Although there are a lot of theoretical benefits of green tea, when you look at the actual human studies of green tea when applied as a cream, there aren't really that many compelling results showing that green tea creams make a difference. Now there is more substantial evidence when it comes to drinking green tea, but even in that case, there are some studies that compared people taking green tea extracts for two years versus those people not taking them, and they found no meaningful differences when it came to their skin biopsies. Next up, Centella Asiatica. Now this one actually does have pretty compelling evidence when it comes to helping with wound healing in particular. It's also shown to minimize inflammation and provide good moisturizing when it comes to human skin. And all of these studies are actually done on human skin. So how about bee venom? Well, again, even though there are some theoretical benefits and some studies may be showing a minor improvement when it comes to helping wrinkles in human skin, so far I would say the jury is out. So if you were running low on money and you were planning to stick your face into a beehive as part of your skincare routine, I would advise against it. Now, although there are very few high quality studies done on snail mucin when used on human skin, if you break down what the components of snail mucin are, you find that it contains glycolic acid, it contains hyaluronic acid, and also allantoin. Now, when you look at all of those ingredients, we have really compelling evidence that they help with exfoliating, moisturizing, and also minimizing inflammation for each of those in turn. Snail mucin also has great antibacterial properties, and that's because snails have terrible immune systems, and so they need their slime to ward off bacteria before it ever gets into their bodies. So yeah, I'm a fan. Slime me up. In summary, Centella Asiatica and Snail Mucin have pretty good evidence that they are helpful for the skin, but green tea and bee venom, the jury is out. And to be honest, I don't think Korean skincare has some incredible natural ingredients that we can't compare with here in the West, because we have a bunch of things like chamomile and aloe and licorice, 
which are also natural for you natural lovers out there and have good evidence that they can help. Now let's move on to double cleansing. And this has taken the skincare world by storm, so we have to give credit to K-Beauty for bringing this mainstream. Now the principle here is simple, and it can be summarized as like removes like. This means that oil-based cleansers are used first to remove oily substances such as makeup and sunscreen, while water-based cleansers are then used afterwards to remove water-soluble impurities, which is basically everything else. By using both type of cleansers, you can make sure that your skin is as clean as possible before you carry on the rest of your routine. Now there's no doubt that double cleansing will remove more impurities compared to single cleansing. But there's also no doubt that double cleansing is going to leave your skin slightly less hydrated compared to single cleansing. For some people, that's going to be a great way to remove excess oiliness from their skin, but it's not necessarily the right approach for everyone. Some people might find that using a simple micellar water and some cotton swabs is a great way to remove their sunscreen or makeup, and then they can just use one water based cleanser to clean the rest of their skin while retaining as much moisture as possible. So again, it may be beneficial for some people. I don't want the double cleansing mafia showing up in my comments below telling me that it changed their lives. I believe you. You come to me on the day of my daughter's wedding. We're going to cut that. But for some people, it may not be necessary. And on the subject of potentially unnecessary skincare, Let's move on to the infamous 10-step Korean skincare routine. This involves the oil-based cleanser and water-based cleanser that we just talked about, followed by an exfoliator, a toner, an essence, a serum, then a sheet mask, an eye cream, a moisturizer, and a sunscreen. Now, honestly, this is some of the dumbest shit I've heard in my life. Now, okay, double cleansing, I mentioned it may be justified, but an exfoliator each night is unnecessary and actually probably damaging. A toner is also basically unnecessary for most people. An essence and a serum and then a moisturizer as three separate things is absolutely insane. I swear, they just made up the word essence so that they could have another product to sell you in an even smaller bottle for an even higher price. And then a sheet mask each day. I mean, genuinely, who has the time for this? An eye cream is not essential, and then sunscreen, we can agree on. So really, this 10-step routine should be a maximum of five steps if you include the double cleansing, the moisturizer, one serum, and a sunscreen. But in fairness, the good thing about a 10-step Korean skincare routine is that it takes so long to finish that you never really leave the bathroom. And so that really minimizes the amount of UV exposure you can possibly get, which is a great skin benefit. Now this is something I hear a lot about K-Beauty. Because their country is much more progressive when it comes to allowing new products and ingredients, it means that they're so much more innovative and that means that they've left our Western skincare companies behind. This is especially true when it comes to their sunscreen, we're told. So why don't we interrogate that specific claim? Are Korean sunscreens actually better? Well, in short, yes. I'll do a detailed video about this at some point in the future, but in summary, the US sunscreen industry is an absolute shambles. Based on the FDA classification of sunscreens as drugs, and therefore the strict regulation that comes with that, there hasn't actually been a new sunscreen ingredient approved by the FDA since the 1990s. For context, this is what a computer looked like back then. And this hairstyle was actually in fashion. But fear not, because in 2014, Congress passed the Sunscreen Innovation Act, which legally required the FDA to approve some new sunscreen ingredients within 180 days of it passing. So thankfully, since then, there's been a bunch of new innovative ingredients that... Th there hasn't? But you said it was a law. Okay, so it turns out the Sunscreen Innovation Act did nothing, but we just have to hope that the no really, this time we're serious, Sunscreen Innovation Act is on its way. But until the NTTWRSSIA has passed, we're kind of stuck with what we've got. And that is physical sunscreens containing zinc and titanium, which often leave a white cast and can feel very thick. Or chemical sunscreens containing oxybenzone or avobenzone, which can be irritating to the skin, potentially damaging to the coral reefs. And also they can be absorbed through the skin into the bloodstream with as yet unknown human effects. So yeah, we're really spoiled for choice. In contrast, the Korean skincare market, much like Europe, has access to some really innovative sunscreen ingredients. These include ingredients like Tinozorb S and Uvinol A+, which do a great job of blocking both UVA and UVB spectrum light, as well as only absorbing very minimally into the body. They're also much more stable when compared to oxybenzone. Having access to safer chemical sunscreen ingredients means that in Korean beauty, they can focus on making the products feel lightweight, blending nicely, and not leaving any white cast. So on this one, Korean skincare really does win. However, with this rapid regulatory approval and much more innovation, there can actually be downsides. Let me tell you about the Korean sunscreen scandal of 2020, when one Korean sunscreen was found in bed with another, even though it was in a long-term relationship with a green tea serum. 
I'm not even proud of myself for that one. It's, it's just wasting all of our time. Okay, but for real, the scandal began when a Korean consumer rights group called the KCA did an investigation into some of the most popular sunscreen brands on the market. They found that when they independently tested these products, the true SPF or sun protective factor value was actually around 15 when they claimed it was 50 plus. Now, since then, it's claimed that the industry has reformed itself, but just keep in mind that when you have less strict regulations, it can mean that bad actors can basically make up their claims. And this isn't just about sunscreens. In the US, it's really tightly regulated what kind of skin benefit claims you can make about your product before it starts to get classified as a drug. Now, this can be a nightmare if you've ever explored making your own skincare product, which maybe I have, but it's actually good for the overall consumers. The brands can't make claims willy-nilly here in the US, and in Korea, they're a bit more permissive about this. Now we're gonna head more into my own speculation and where I get a little bit more cynical about everyone's obsession with K-beauty. Now, do I think most people are getting into the weeds of clinical trial data when it comes to in vivo or in vitro results of Korean skincare ingredients and comparing the regulatory landscapes of Korea with America? No. The reason Korean skincare is so popular right now is because Korean everything is hot right now. Whether it's K-pop or Korean streetwear or even Korean TV shows, we are seeing more and more Koreans on our screen than ever before. And these aren't just regular everyday Koreans, we're seeing their pop stars, their movie stars, their models. And it's really tempting to think, oh my God, all Koreans have incredible skin. What is their secret? Oh, you mean aside from the Hollywood level makeup artists, the airbrushing, and also the self-selection for which type of people actually end up on screen. So just remember that you might see a lot of normal Americans or British people or Indians around you, depending on where you live. And then you're comparing their skin and your skin to that of Korean superstars and attributing the difference to a toner. But what if I'm oversimplifying it? What if the average Korean actually does have better skin than other people? Well, we don't know if that's true, but even if it was, remember that the appearance of your skin is actually influenced by a lot of things other than what you actually put on it. Here's a comparison table between the United States and Korea, comparing various lifestyle aspects such as smoking and diet that we know can impact the quality of your skin. So even if we were to accept that the average Korean has better and clearer skin than the average American, even then it may be nothing to do with their fermented creams. And beyond all of that, I want you to remember that Korea had the highest rate of facial cosmetic surgery in the world last year, with 13.4% of their adult population having had surgery. Oh, and what about Botox and filler, which is technically non-surgical? Well, the percentage of the adult population in Korea that has had either Botox or filler done is a staggering 23% compared to the 3% in the United States. But no, let's focus on the green tea. That's actually why they look so young. Whatever way you wanna spin it, Korean culture is absolutely beauty obsessed and that's fine. There is nothing wrong with that. But I do think it's pretty ironic that Korean beauty is all about natural green tea and natural bee venom and natural snail mucin as well as the natural blade of a plastic surgeon to reconstruct your face. So my conclusion when it comes to K-beauty is that yes, it has better sunscreens in the US, so does Europe. It's also pioneered the use of some natural skincare ingredients like Centella Asiatica and also Snail Mucin that have decent evidence for being helpful, although not close to topical retinoids. But moving on to the downsides, I think their 10 step skincare routine is a complete joke and totally overkill. And I think the real reason people are obsessed with Korean skincare is because Korean culture is hot right now. We see Korean superstars on our screens with perfect skin and we wrongly attribute that to their skincare routines. When in reality, Korea is a country with the highest rates of cosmetic surgery, Botox and filler in the world. And they also have healthier diets and lower rates of smoking. All of these factors make a much bigger impact on their skin than how much snail mucin they use. Whew, so yeah. Mian Mian Ajay. Why is that problematic? I'm literally speaking Korean. Thanks for watching guys. I'll see you in the next one if I'm not canceled.